Would we be better off without religion? This in part is a historical question. 2,000 years of history help us to answer whether Jesus has made our world a worse place to live in. And so we're grateful to have a historian speaking tonight. Dr. Dixon holds a PhD in ancient history and is a senior research fellow at the Department of Ancient History at Macquarie University. John's written a dozen books, including A, Spe a Spectator's Guide to World Religions. John is the director of, or a director of the Centre for Public Christianity. And in partnership with Channel 7, he has produced two major documentaries, The Christ Files and Life of Jesus. John's going to be speaking to us from his perspective as a historian, but also from his perspective as a Christian. His worldview doesn't disqualify him from following historical method. And our hope is that no matter what our worldview is tonight, we might be stimulated, challenged, excited, and changed by our time together. So, will you please join with me in welcoming the 2011 Smith Lecturer, Dr. John Dixon. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I should uh, confess uh, right up front that uh, the topic isn't original. Uh, when I was asked uh, how I might address this topic and what title I might give it, I basically just ripped it off from a uh, Sydney Morning Herald debate that I was involved in uh, behind the scenes uh, as a director of the Centre for Public Christianity. Sydney Morning Herald, some years ago, put on this we'd be better off without religion debate. Uh, 2,000 people came into the live debate, many more thousands uh, watched it uh, live uh, online. And there were three speakers speaking for the motion that we'd be better off without religion and three speaking against the motion. Christianity was the main focus, uh, perhaps for you know, obvious reasons. We live in a society that's been impacted by uh, Christianity more than uh, by any other religious tradition. Uh, that's just the nature of our historical course. And so Christianity got thumped all night. And it was so interesting because the Sydney Morning Herald uh, organizers conducted a poll of those entering into the auditorium and then a poll uh, for the exiting and compared because obviously they wanted to see if anyone had changed their minds. Uh, interesting to note that overwhelmingly the motion won both votes. We would be better off without religion and Christianity in particular. It was a spectacular public loss uh, for the Christians. That was the evening I realized with clarity something that had been percolating in the back of my mind for some years but hadn't really put my finger on it. Whereas Christians used to be mainly criticized for being self-righteous, holier than thou, moralistic, it now seems at least as common, if not more common, to describe Christianity as immoral, evil, and poisonous. I suspect that September 11, 2001, is part of the sociological reason for this shift that's taken place in the West, where we now think of religion as a great evil. Uh, I should say that only two rather extremist perspectives view 9-11 as a strictly religious event. Uh, one is the Wahhabi sect of Islam, a quite minority sect in Islam that really does see it uh, as a religious event since Al-Qaeda draws its ideology from Wahhabi Islam. And the other uh, extremist uh, movement that sees it as profoundly religious is the New Atheists. Uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Michel Onfray are all quite open about the fact that that event galvanized them in uh, the need to take on religion in the public sphere. They are wise enough not to make Islam the specific target. Um, 
but the way they read 9-11 is that this is just the, the kind of pinnacle act of something that is uh, possible with any religion. And in their works, Christianity is the main target. Uh, this is true, uh, whether it's Christopher Hitchens uh, or Dawkins or whatever. And I think as a result of their work, whatever vague notions Australians had about the, the dumb stuff religions done through history, um, has come to the fore, so that now this is one of the most common criticisms you hear, uh, that religion poisons everything. I want to approach this topic of the problem of religious violence and uh, perhaps the damage Christianity has done through history in particular, in three parts. Firstly, I want to point out how serious this complaint is. Uh, then I want to spend some time unpacking what I think is perhaps um, wrong or incomplete about the criticism. And then I want to point out Jesus' own answer to the problem of religious violence. So firstly, the seriousness of the complaint. Uh, I think the idea that Christianity has started most of the wars of history and has damaged and raped and pillaged has been in the top 10 reasons not to pursue Christianity for many, many years. But I think it's shot to about number two uh, in these last uh, 10 years for the reasons I've just outlined. Uh, I remember at a, at a dinner party recently, uh, a gentleman, uh, very intelligent, self-made, very successful, was adamant that Christianity had started most of the wars of history. And it seemed like a truism that didn't need defending. Um, of course, I quizzed him about uh, the data and, and where he drew his information, and that led to a very interesting conversation. But it struck me just how, how easily that uh, sentence rolls off the tongue, that Christianity has started most of the wars of history. Uh, the most articulate exponent of this view is probably uh, Christopher Hitchens in his book already mentioned, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And he really does mean everything. Let me uh, read this. A beautiful writing. We believe with certainty that an ethical life can be lived without religion. And we know for a fact that the corollary holds true, that religion has caused innumerable people not just to conduct themselves no better than others, but to award themselves permission to behave in ways that would make a brothel keeper or an ethnic cleanser to raise an eyebrow. I often think, why does the devil have all the best writing? <laughs> or this, in Belfast, I have seen whole streets burned out by sectarian warfare between different sects of Christianity and interviewed people whose relatives and friends have been kidnapped or killed or tortured by rival religious death squads, often for no other reason than membership of another confession. I guess I want to acknowledge how serious uh, this complaint is. And I also want to concede that it's partly right. Uh, I think. One of the problems with uh, being a student of history is that you're confronted with the primary sources for all of these things, and uh, a lot of it's not pretty. Christians have done terrible things in the name of Christ uh, throughout their 2,000 years. And this is not just a Roman Catholic problem with their um, Spanish Inquisition uh, or their Crusades. It's also a Protestant problem. Two of the great heroes of the Protestant faith uh, did and said things that leave a lot to be desired. Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant tradition, uh, wrote the most awful things about European Jews in his 1543 tract, uh, The Jews and Their Lies. It's probably an exaggeration to say that this led to uh, the feeling that then led to the Holocaust, but uh, it certainly didn't help uh, Europeans think about Jewish communities. It is a vile document, and I urge every Protestant uh, who clings to the great Protestant tradition to go and read it for yourself, what one of the heroes of Protestantism uh, wrote. It will, it will baffle you. Uh, John Calvin, the founder of the Reformation tradition in early, uh, in, um, uh, modern, early modern Europe, 
was, I think it's fair to say, harsh in his treatment of heretics. Now there's a debate over the exact details, but one thing is clear, Calvin pressed for the execution of Michael Servetus, um, a heretic who had the wrong view of the Trinity. And because he had the wrong view of the Trinity and he was influential, uh, Calvin <coughs> certainly pressed for his execution. Christians need to face up to the fact that people have done and said awful things in the name of Christ. They have failed to live up uh, to the one they claim is Lord. Um, but interestingly, Christians should have no problem admitting this. Uh, <laughs> since Christians are probably the only ones still in Western society who have given up that rather conservative view that we are inherently good through and through and have opted for the more radical view that says we're rather bad through and through. And so it shouldn't really be a problem for Christians to, to, to own up to this and say that some of our own heroes uh, have acted in ways that indeed would make a brothel keeper or ethnic cleanser to raise an eyebrow to pinch Christopher Hitchens' phrase. This is a real problem. There's no hiding from it. But let me unpack what I think is wrong with the complaint, or at least incomplete. Uh, firstly, retellings of the evils of Christendom very frequently involve gross exaggerations. Very frequently involve gross exaggerations. Let me introduce you to a book that if you're interested in this whole topic is well worth your reading, published uh, by Yale University Press in 2009 by Professor David Bentley Hart. Um, I don't like the title, I'm sure that's one of those publisher's titles. Uh, the prof himself probably didn't want such a belligerent title, but there you go. Uh, it is a, a stunning um, overview of the impact of early Christianity in the Greco-Roman world and through the Middle Ages, uh, the period that very few people know about. And we think of the world, you know, we think of Greece and Rome and maybe early Christianity and then it was, you know, it was all dark until, uh, you know, maybe the 15th century or something. Um, but he's an expert in that middle uh, period. Fascinating, fascinating uh, reading. One of the most powerful things he does in this book is he demonstrates how every new era tends to retell the story of the previous era in a way that makes itself look really good by making the previous era look really bad. And uh, we do this on a small scale when we talk about how prudish 1950s Australia was or how moralistic uh, Victorian England was and, and so on. We, we tend to describe ourselves in glowing terms, you know, uh, that we've, we're the great uh, bringer of freedoms compared to the period gone past. Now, Bentley Hart, I think, ably demonstrates that this happened on a massive scale in the 18th century as Enlightenment popularists popularised the expression, the Dark Ages. This was actually a cunning piece of propaganda. Uh, those who were part of the secular enlightenment, of course, needed a tag to describe the thing they delivered us from as an opposite. And so if we're in an enlightenment, what came before was dark. It was the dark ages. And so um, I only need to say, you know, you know, thank God we don't live in the dark ages. And you all know what I mean. It's, an, it's a completely accepted canon of Western history. Except that it's probably entirely false as a description of that period. Let me uh, read to you uh, Bentley Hart's analysis of this, how the modern world reinterpreted the past in order uh, to make itself look good. Hence modernity's first great attempt to define itself, an age of reason emerging from and overthrowing an age of faith. Behind this definition lay a simple but thoroughly enchanting tale. Once upon a time, it went, Western humanity was the cosseted and incurious ward of Mother Church. During this, the age of faith, culture stagnated, science languished, wars of religion were routinely waged, Witches were burned by inquisitors, and Western humanity laboured in brutish subjugation to dogma. 
all was darkness. Then in the wake of the wars of religion that had torn Christendom apart, came the full flowing of the Enlightenment, and with it the reign of reason and progress. The secular nation state arose, reduced religion to an establishment of the state, and thereby rescued Western humanity from the blood steeped intolerance of religion. This is, as I say, a simple and enchanting tale, easily followed and utterly captivating in its explanatory tidiness. Its sole defect is that it happens to be false in every identifiable detail. This tale of the birth of the modern world has largely disappeared from respectable academic literature and now survives principally at the level of folklore, intellectual journalism and vulgar legend. He's true about one thing, uh, historians do not refer to that Middle Ages period as the Dark Ages. I mean, it's nuts when you actually read uh, the literature of the so-called Dark Ages and the art and so on, and the philosophy that's going on. Uh, to call it dark is, is just to um, prove ignorance. Um, let me give you two striking examples of what Bentley Hart um, uh, describes as the exaggeration of this period of uh, the so-called Dark Ages. Firstly, the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, th this is just almost a cliche now. Those of you who are Monty Python fans will know <laughs> a particular Monty Python sketch about the Spanish Inquisition that nobody expects. Um, but the Spanish Inquisition is often uh, put forward as uh, the prime example of Christianity at its most uh, ferocious. And so you sometimes hear people speak of the hundreds of thousands killed by the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, in uh, the Fairfax Papers just uh, two weeks ago, Elizabeth Farrelly, uh, very well-respected journalist, uh, ended her little piece on religion by speaking about the millions tortured and killed in uh, the Spanish Inquisition. These were her secular martyrs, she said. Uh, the reality is, over its 350-year history, the Spanish Inquisition probably uh, killed 6,000 people at an upper limit. 350 years, 6,000 people. Uh, this comes on the authority of one of the leading Inquisition scholars in the world, uh, Edward Peters, uh, who is uh, the Charles Lee Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I could tell you a sidebar story of, of I emailed him just to uh, check uh, some data on the Inquisition and uh, got quite a hilarious email back because he thought I was a journalist trying to do what journalists do and inflate the numbers of the Spanish Inquisition and he swore at me in the most dramatic way uh, for being one of those kind of people. I sheepishly wrote back to say it's not really my intention, I just want the reliable data. Anyway, he didn't email me back. <laughs> but he did answer my question uh, in the first email amid swearing. But 6,000 over 350 uh, years, 18 a year, there's no doubt it's a blasphemy. Any death in the name of Christ is a blasphemy uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, my question though is how did the Spanish Inquisition come to be regarded as the sort of the pinnacle of the ferocity of religion. Or take the Northern Ireland conflict. Uh, let's concede for the sake of this forum that it was an entirely religious conflict. Uh, that's the narrative uh, that uh, Christopher Hitchens uh, tells in his description of this. Uh, people dispute that and, and think there are all sorts of other re uh, reasons for the Northern Ireland Troubles, but let me just concede that those 30 years Troubles were religiously motivated. Uh, it's well known that the 30 years Northern Ireland Troubles led to the deaths of 3,500 people. 3,500 people. Again, one death over who's got the right theology is, uh, is a complete blasphemy, so don't hear me minimising uh, this by any stretch of the imagination. But I ask, how did the Northern Ireland conflict come to be the pinnacle of the ferocity of Christianity? Especially when you compare to an entirely secular conflict like the French Revolution. Uh, we know that as many 
people were killed in the single year, 1793-94, the great terror of the French Revolution, as were killed in the entire Northern Ireland conflict. Three and a half thousand people. One year fighting for secular liberty matched 30 years of warring religious parties. And this introduces the second complaint that I have uh, with this criticism that Christianity leads to violence. Not only is it exaggerated, it misses a very significant point. The violence of Christendom is dwarfed by the bloodshed of completely non-religious or irreligious conflicts in uh, just recent history. Uh, when someone says religion has started most of the wars, uh, really it's one of those things that, that passes uh, because it's entered our culture as a truism, not because anyone could actually uh, demonstrate that to be true. Let's think of World War I in no sense uh, a religious conflict, I think we'll all agree, though 8 million people were killed. World War II in no sense a religious conflict, 35 million people killed. You just have to pause and say how, how is it in any way plausible to say that religion started most of the wars or has caused most of the bloodshed. Uh, and then there's the awkward fact that the 20th century's great atheistic regimes uh, were not improvements on Christendom, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Stalin's openly atheistic project uh, killed conservatively 20 million people. That is 6,000 a week. Uh, his project killed more people per week than the Spanish Inquisition killed in 350 years. Uh, the numbers for Mao aren't uh, reliably known. Some place it as low as 10 million, others 50. It doesn't really matter when you're talking those sorts of numbers which you pick. Uh, Pol Pot uh, is responsible for the deaths of 2 million of the 8 million in his population. These were uh, publicly, uh, decidedly atheistic movements. There's no avoiding that. Though I am well aware of the uh, new atheist retort to the claim that atheism has also led to bloodshed. Uh, I've uh, seen uh, Hitchens and Dawkins uh, run the argument that basically says Stalin's atheism was itself a kind of grand ideology and so therefore religious. So with a wave of the wand suddenly all of Stalin's deaths become evidence for the violence of religion because that kind of atheism is religious. It's ingenious but I think we'd all agree it's an avoidance strategy at best. The other tack uh, that the atheist sometimes adopts, uh, I know Dawkins does, is to say uh, on the other hand that Stalin's violence was completely unrelated to his atheism. So in a lecture uh, Dawkins gave in the US uh, a, a couple of years ago, he makes the, the quip, the quite funny quip, that Hitler was a vegetarian that doesn't make vegetarianism responsible for the Holocaust. Got to admit that's cute. Okay, but um, it's pretty disingenuous uh, to say that Stalin's ardent conviction that religion was false and regressive was unrelated to his systematic eradication of religious people, I think is just pushing things uh, too far. Now, I am not saying that atheism necessarily leads to violence any more than one can say that religion leads to violence. Uh, I guess my point is both can lead to violence. Both have led to violence. Uh, so as I think of this, really I'm led to the conclusion that religion or irreligion isn't the problem. It's the human heart that is the problem. The human heart in possession of a passion, unrestrained. The human heart in possession of a passion unrestrained, a passion for land, wealth, honour, these are really what drive uh, the conflicts in our world. 
This brings me to the third and final part of the talk. Not only how serious this complaint is, uh, not only what I think is uh, incomplete uh, or perhaps wrong about the complaint that Christianity leads to violence, let me move uh, to Jesus' own answer to the problem of religious violence. And here I honestly think the claim that Christianity leads to violence begins to unravel uh, quite badly. Jesus was relentless in his call to humble service and his rejection of uh, the use of power uh, for the sake of uh, his cause. So here's a passage from Luke 6. If um, this were a more historical lecture in Macquarie University Ancient History Department, I'd point out that uh, this text comes from the shared source behind Luke and Matthew, which scholars call Q, which therefore makes it one of the earliest sources we have for the historical Jesus. But you don't really want to know that, other than this is, in the opinion of all uh, historical Jesus experts, uh, front and center the teaching of the historical Jesus. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This highlights what I think is the deepest problem with the argument that Christianity uh, leads to repression and violence. At best, the criticism of Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and so on um, only proves that Christians haven't been Christian enough. Even if I accept everything these uh, writers say about the history, even if I don't try and pick this as an exaggeration or that as a falsehood, if I accept it all, all they have demonstrated is that Christians haven't lived Christianly, which is something Christians actually admit most days of the week, uh, in fact, truth be told. It is patently clear to anyone uh, with even the vaguest uh, notion of what Christianity and its origins uh, taught that Jesus demanded love of enemies, turning the other cheek, and so on. The problem with the violent Christian, therefore, is not her Christianity, uh, but her lack of Christianity, if I can put it like this. Dismissing Christianity because of the church's failure to live Christianly is a bit like dismissing Johann Sebastian Bach after hearing a five-year-old attempt one of his cello suites. Do you know this piece? Now, this is not being played by my six-year-old. This is being played by Yo-Yo Ma, the greatest cellist in the world. But what if you'd heard my child play this piece? you might not think so highly of Johann Sebastian Bach. And you know you have to distinguish between the original composition and the sometimes rather poor performance. In order to truly judge the worth of a composition, you have to hear it in its best performance. And so I'm sure you can see uh, what I'm saying here. Jesus wrote a beautiful composition, a beautiful composition. Uh, mainstream scholars in secular ancient history departments all around the world, Christian, non-Christian, Jewish, whatever, agree there was a Jesus of Nazareth and that he taught to love enemies as a central principle of his ethic. That's front and center. That's the beautiful composition, and it's true that Christians have not unswervingly lived up to that. So I would say the solution to religious evil or Christian evil is not less Christianity but more. The solution to Christian evil is not less Christianity but more. In fact, this is a point made by someone... Uh, far brighter than all of us probably put together. Albert Einstein, in an essay he wrote in 1915, 
uh, for German nationalists uh, puts this in a very compelling way. It's the last uh, <coughs> sentence or two of the essay. But why so many words when I can say it in one sentence and in a sentence very appropriate for a Jew? Honour your master Jesus Christ, not only in words and songs, but rather foremost in your deeds. Albert Einstein calling on German Christians not to abandon Christianity, but to be Christian. That is the solution to the so-called evils of Christianity. And this introduces my final problem with the argument that Christianity uh, leads to uh, violence and repression and so on, that it poisons everything. This argument concedes nothing of the great good that Christianity has brought into the Western world. And as much as I am confronted by the horrible things in Christian history, uh, I am overwhelmed by the vast number of Christians who did in fact sing the tune Jesus wrote. Maybe not as perfectly as they should, but pretty well nonetheless. We know in the first year of early Christianity, they established a very large food roster in Jerusalem. It required seven people to look after the food roster. But this is in the very, very beginning of Christianity. We know in the decades afterwards that the Apostle Paul established a 10-year financial collection from uh, people in what we call Turkey, uh, Macedonia and Greece uh, for the famine-ravaged people of Judea who had just faced a, a, a terrible crisis in this period. Uh, this is perhaps the first recorded international aid project. The first recorded international aid project. We know that by the year 250, as Christianity gains momentum, the poverty role in the Roman church was 1,500 people. That is 1,500 people being fed daily by the Roman church. Now, please, when I say the Roman church, don't think the Vatican with its, you know, treasures down below uh, and, and great works of art. In the year 250, things aren't going terribly well for the Christians still. Uh, they're still basically illegal. They're still uh, being killed and persecuted and so on. And yet the Roman church was feeding 1,500 people a day. Uh, this actually made the poverty roll of the uh, Roman church the largest association in ancient Rome. Amazing. Bigger than the Baker's Union or the Metal Workers Union or all the unions, that ancient Rome had lots of unions. But the poverty role of the Roman church was the largest association in antiquity. Extraordinary. Even small churches were doing the same thing. Quite moving stories uh, recorded. Uh, we have very good records of this. That during the great persecution at the beginning of the 4th century, so for the first uh, decade of the fourth century, uh, Christians were being slaughtered uh, in their hundreds and thousands. Churches were being uh, destroyed uh, by the imperial forces and so on. And what was quite common is that uh, the authorities would enter the churches and try and find anything of value in the churches, whether they were books that could be reused uh, or um, furniture or they expected there to be treasures in the basement, just as the pagan temples had uh, treasures in the basement. It was quite normal for pagan temples to have an entire treasury, a banking system uh, beneath the temples. And, and they just assumed churches were the same. And we have this very good record of uh, the little church of Kurta in what we call Lib uh, Libya. Uh, soldiers entered into the church, went down to the basement to find the treasures of the church. And the court records themselves report the discovery of, and I'm quoting, a storage room for the poor, 16 tunics for men, 
82 dresses for women, 13 pairs of men's shoes, 47 women's shoes, 19 <coughs> peasant capes, and 10 vats of oil and wine for the poor. I would say they did find the treasures of the church. By the 4th century, uh, Emperor Julian, the pagan emperor, became so fearful of the Christians uh, that he started a great movement against them and started writing books against them uh, because he was worried they were taking over the Roman world by the stealth of their good deeds. <laughs> and uh, we have his letters written to the pagan priests uh, of the region demanding that they institute in pagan temples a welfare system based on the one in the Christian churches. Here's a letter written to Arcasius, the pagan high priest of Galatia, uh, what we call Turkey, written in the year 362, the year before Emperor Julian died. Uh, listen to the tone, but listen to also the evidence it presents of early Christians. Why do we not observe that it is the Christians' benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, and the pretended holiness of their lives that have done most to increase this atheism? He called Christianity atheism because it disputed the existence of the Greek and Roman gods. I believe that we ought really and truly to practice every one of these virtues. In every city, establish frequent hostels in order that strangers may profit by our benevolence. For it is disgraceful that the impious Galileans, the Christians, support not only their own poor, but ours as well. <laughs> All men see that our people lack aid from us. Moving to the modern period the first Western discussion of innate human rights came not in 18th century Enlightenment circles, but in the 13th century discussions of canon lawyers who were reflecting on the New Testament, what it taught about the rights of the poor and the alien. That's where our Western human rights language uh, first developed. We could talk, of course, about William Wilberforce's um, amazing work to end slavery in the British realm. And you only have to read a little of William Wilberforce to know that he did it out of his um, evangelical, Christian evangelical convictions about the, uh, the image of God being in every person and the love of God for all. We could talk about Lord Shaftesbury's amazing efforts in the 1800s um, as the leader of the Evangelical Anglicans in Britain, he led amazing political reforms that liberated children and women from the mines, that changed laws about mental illness that are now our laws, that mentally ill people are full human beings, uh, established all sorts of food programs around England and so on, and did it under the inspiration of his Christian faith. Of course, we could talk about Martin Luther uh, King, uh, who was inspired by his Christian faith and when he called America uh, to treat people justly, he called on them to read their Bibles properly. It was a biblical call. Or we could think of Desmond Tutu's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which many uh, regard as the principal reason why at the end of apartheid there was not outright bloodshed uh, and revenge killings left, right and centre. Even today, uh, most non-government welfare in this country is conducted by faith-based agencies. Uh, the Australian government released uh, its own report from the Department of Families, Community Service and Indigenous Affairs in 2004, which uh, made clear that the more religiously active a person is, the more likely they are to give money away philanthropically and volunteer in the local community. I'm almost embarrassed to point out that 19 of the 24 largest charities in Australia by revenue are Christian. 19 of the 24 largest by revenue. This does not make Christians better than non-Christians. Okay. This does not make Christians better than non-Christians. That is not my point. And I wouldn't even be led down this path were it not for the claim that actually Christians are worse 
that they poison everything. Um, I don't think Christians are better than non-Christians. I really don't. I'm with C.S. Lewis, who said Christians are not better than non-Christians. They're just better than they would be without their Christianity. <laughs> Christians may turn out to be mass murderers or Mother Teresa's. But the thing that's worth pondering is only one of these is actually logically compatible with Christianity. Only one of these is inspired by Christianity. Only one of these is continuing to sing the tune that Jesus himself wrote. Let me end with a little postscript from the Sydney Morning Herald debate some years ago. I told you that the entrance and exit polls were a huge loss for religion and Christianity. Uh, the motion we'd be better off without religion overwhelmingly won both polls. But they did announce at the end that there'd been a movement of just one <laughs> against the motion. A movement of just one against the motion. Isn't that interesting? I took that as a minor success. <laughs> and uh, because I was involved just behind the scenes uh, in this event, this young man uh, spotted me, came up to me, and uh, was all excited, thinking that he was the one. Statistically, he may not have been. There may have been all sorts of changes. But he, he was excited that he was the one who had changed his mind. He'd entered the building thinking we'd be better off without Christianity and left thinking we wouldn't be. And so, of course, I asked him, what was it that changed your mind? And he said, it wasn't any of that sort of highbrow intellectual stuff I heard tonight. It was a simple question someone asked the audience. Someone asked, forget about all the intellectual arguments. Just now, think of the one sincerely Christian person in your life. And ask yourself, would the world be better off without their faith or with it? And he said, I thought of this auntie that I've got who's, you know, into that Christianity stuff. And I thought, there's no way the world would be better off without her Christianity. No way. So I changed my mind, he said. Good on him. I think there's a challenge for spectators and religious believers in that. The challenge for spectators is, I guess, not to just accept truisms from our culture, like Christianity started most of the wars of history, but to actually look around at the sincerely Christian people you know and ask yourself whether Christianity is a good thing in their life and through them for others. It's quite risky for me to put this uh, to you because, of course, you may have some horrible Christian in your life and, um, well, I just have to live with that reality. But there's a challenge here, of course, for Christian believers. Uh, the challenge for you is to be the kind of person that changes minds on this question. To be the kind of person that sings the beautiful tune that Jesus wrote, that lives the life he really did uh, bring into our Western tradition. And with that, I end. Thank you. Thank you.